Welcome to this bite-sized episode in which I take one lesson from one of my previous conversations and have a closer look. Hello and welcome back, Simon here. So, a question. What does success mean to you? Is it about reaching your goals, ticking them off and picking up the accolades as you go along? Or is there more to it than that? Now, in my experience of interviewing a large number of people who are considered by society standards to be very successful, what's clear is that it doesn't guarantee happiness or satisfaction. Take Ronnie O'Sullivan. He's widely considered to be the greatest snooker player of all time. And I had the pleasure of sitting down with him for a long chat near his house in Essex. And I found him to be a really lovely bloke. He was incredibly open and accommodating and friendly and likeable. And he really shared how he struggled, even as he was having one of the most successful seasons in snooker history. So we chatted about when he first won the World Championships, which was back in 2001. And he explained how his mental state at the time was really precarious. Now, Ronnie's gone on to win the World Championship six times in total. He's actually in action at the Crucible currently, aiming for title number seven. But what was really clear chatting to Ronnie was that he recognised that trophies do not guarantee happiness. For him, relationships, giving and serving a cause bigger than himself is where fulfillment is to be found. And it's an outlook I really admire and is one that can be somewhat at odds with how so many people in our culture define success. So here is Ronnie the Rocket O'Sullivan. When you won your first world title, yeah. what was your internal landscape like? We know what Terrible. you were like. Terrible. Terrible, yeah. The day the tournament started, I was on the phone to the Samaritans having panic attacks. The week before I went to the World Championships, I was sitting in my garden around the corner with my partner at the time. Couldn't couldn't be around people. I was just about, you know, I could be around her, but I just had these panic attacks and I, I could just like be in a room of people. And um, and I thought, you know, and I remember sitting there, <laughs> was watching the snooker because it had just started and Darren Morgan was um, talking about the World Championships and he went well for me Ronnie O'Sullivan's the favourite to win this and I'm sitting there watching it and she went to me she said did you hear that and I went what she went did you hear what he just said there and I went yeah yeah she went just go and win it and I was like and then I get to Sheffield and um, yeah I was doing a radio interview with some I can't remember who it was and I was trying to hold it together and I was just saying all the right things and but inside I was like Whoa, this, is, this is not easy for me and um, I was just spewing out what I thought they wanted to hear but this interview felt like it had gone on for about four hours and I just thought, oh, you know, and at one point I just cracked. I said, look, I'm really struggling here. I said, I'm having panic attacks. You said that, didn't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember the girl and the woman on there was like, oh, we're really sorry. We hope you're all right. We're going to cut the interview short and, you know, we just hope you're all right. They were really, really worried. And I remember sitting, I was in my hotel room in the Hilton in Sheffield and I just put the phone down and I went, oh. I just laid on the bed and I went, oh, and I just phoned the Samaritans. Yeah. I said, look, I am in a bad place. I said, I'm having these panic. And I was nine, ten months clean out of the Priory. I'd had my best snooker season ever. I'd won six out of 11 events. You know, if you was to base success on, like, you know, external things, I was as, it was the most successful season any snooker pl- player had had, you know, even including Stephen Hendry. And um, so I was like, this, 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 in my mind, I'm thinking... Even winning tournaments ain't solving my problem, you know. It's like, what is it? You know, why am I, why am I feeling like this? And um, for me, if I didn't play snooker and didn't have to go for it, I would never have to take any medication ever. It's just that I have this unhealthy relationship with snooker and a lot of my self-worth and value is mm. built around if I do well at snooker, then I'm okay as a person. And But it's not even doing well because, like I said, I won six tournaments. That should have been enough, but it was just performance. So I could have won six tournaments, but if I was scared about my next performance not being good enough, that's what used to frighten me. Am I going to fall apart? Am I just not going to be out of pot of ball? Am I going to embarrass myself out there? Are people going to start laughing at me? They're going to think, you know, he's a fraud. Yeah. And I had all that going on. And, and it's nowhere near as bad as it was. But I still get moments where I just think, oh, you know, I really do doubt myself. And snook, I've realised, and winning titles is great. But it's, you know, if that's all that life is... If what my life is built on is, is around just being success then at some point that's going to go and then what am I left with yeah. you know and I think human relationships are very important and, and, and probably more important than anything you'd ever do because 
you know, we need to interact with people and the healthier the relationships you have, the better your life will be. And you talk about relationships and relationship with self is important mm. as well. And part of self-care is accepting yourself warts and all. And you've spoken yeah. about publicly about some of the difficulties you've had, some of the addictions you've had. Yeah. But actually accepting that as part of yourself, mm. it, that's being kind to yourself and that's a relationship with yourself as well. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think obviously, you know, um, I went through a lot of denial in the early stages that, you know, I didn't think I had an addiction problem, really. Um, I just kind of, I thought, you know, I'd get, I'd, get a, I'd get a month of training and eating well and practicing and, 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 and all that sort of stuff. And then I'd play a tournament and I'd do really well. And then for the next two or three months, I would binge on food and and drink and going out and you know going to nightclubs and it was never me but that was just my addictive side you know I couldn't just have one night out one meal and get back to training the next day I kind of always kept falling off the wagon Mm. and it wasn't until I started looking at addiction you know when you look at addiction it's not just with food it can be around women relationships gambling and you're spending right? you know am i working too hard am i work addict and i'm like you know so it kind of like it covers so many different areas i think it can even cover thinking i think yeah, you, you know yeah. you can over you can get addicted to overthinking can't absolutely you? You get addicted absolutely. to anything yeah yeah i think we i think the western world has become a, a world of addiction in many ways you yeah. know we've forgot what it's like to just sit down as a community and just do things together and help each other, support each other. I think we live in quite a hectic, fast-paced life and everyone's trying to get on top of each other. Everyone wants to climb that ladder and they'll do whatever they do. And and I probably do it unconsciously. I kind of think, I'm not like that. But actually, when I get in that tunnel vision, I've probably trampled on so many people, um, not in a horrible way, but just in my pursuit to be the best. And, um, And, you know, you have to make tough decisions and sometimes you think... You know, when I look back about it, you know, they were ruthless decisions. And I kind of class myself as not being a ruthless person. But because of that pursuit to be the best that I could be, I sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to do it. And then sometimes you think, well, I go to Thailand and it's not like that. They have a different way of success. They kind of, you look at Manny Pacquiao, he'll feed his village. And, you know, for him, it's all about, you know, taking back to the Philippines, making his... And I think that's a much better way to share your success than think... You know, maybe, you know, you've got the Manny Pacquiao way and you've got the Floyd Mayweather way. Floyd Mayweather go and buy loads of Bugattis and cars and spend it yeah. and it's bling, bling, bling. And a lot of the Western world think, you know, that's what I aspire to be. Yeah. I don't. I aspire to be the more the Manny Pacquiao. I think yeah. for, for me, he has got the balance right. He's doing it for a greater good. He's, you know, he's, he's taking poverty out of his country. He wants to make his country a better place. And for me, uh, that's where, that's the side I would much rather yeah, you know, be and and I have to kind of force myself to kind of be more like that. I find I receive more when I give. Mm. I mean, just for example, there's this young Chinese kid. He's on the snooker tour. He's got amazing talent. I call him the Federer of snooker. I know a lot of people call me the Federer of snooker, but this kid has got more talent than anyone I've ever really? seen. If there was a player that I could help, it's him. I'd like to do what Ray Reardon done for me with him. It's and it's sort of like like I said, you know, everyone's like, oh, Ronnie's the most talented. He's this and that. I wasn't a complete player until I spent two years with Ray Reardon. And if I wouldn't have spent them two years with Ray Reardon, I maybe would have got one or two world titles at best. Um, may Might have achieved number one, but not for the amount of time mm. that I did. Um, certainly wouldn't be playing as well as I was into my senior years because I've obviously had to reinvent myself. Um, and a lot of that has meant I can't be as attacking or as aggressive as I think I'd like, as I'd like to be. So I've had to learn to you know, to win games differently. So I see him as like a, a little, I hate to say the word project, but someone that I can help and hopefully just watch from afar and just see him become, you know, um, he reminds me of Justin Bieber. I said, you are like Justin Bieber. He's a young kid, handsome. I said, you know, I've just got this vision that he'll win the world title and China's going to go absolutely bananas and go, what, you know, where has he come from? You know, and it, and it you know, that's, you know, it can, it can be one of them things that can just happen overnight, yeah, you yeah. know, like, like Tiger Woods or, or John Daly, they come out and people go, where has he been? Yeah, yeah. You know, but burst the golf, onto the scene. Yeah, Boris, Boris Becker. Becker. Yeah. Boris Becker, you go, yeah. like, what was all that about? You know, and I'd love to see this kid do it. Thanks for listening to this bite-sized episode. Please do drop me a message. If you'd like me to revisit a specific life lesson from one of my earlier conversations, just head to simonmundy.com to get in touch and do sign up to my Monday on Monday newsletter while you're there. 
as well please do share this podcast with anyone who might enjoy it that's it for now from me i'll be back on monday when i'll be joined by the always entertaining barry hearn until then thank you and goodbye <laughs>